Okay, good morning. Let's see how we go with this one. Oh, issues, issues, issues. Audio, 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 but not now. It's all good. Welcome, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, wherever you are. Today we're going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, getting more out of your chord progressions, making them sound more interesting, more colourful, and kind of understanding the options that are available to you when you writing original stuff or when you are working out a cover, but you know, you're playing it quite simply. So today you're in the right place if you are wanting, or if you feel limited just by playing open chords while trying to write original progressions. Um, maybe you don't understand how other people can come up with unique and stylish chord progressions you all seem pretty basic. Um, and you'd like to have some tips on getting out of generic sounding chords, generic. I don't know. It's a thing that I hear a lot of people talk about because they say, oh, all my chords sound the same, um, which isn't actually a bad thing because there's only so many chords. I think what they mean is that my choice of chords is limited. And so I would like some other other options. Hi, Thomas, welcome. I'm just gonna recap um, what I've been talking about in the last 60 seconds. So you're in the right place if you are here to learn a bit more about what you can do with your chords, going beyond basic chords, how you can make your progressions if you're writing music sound a, a bit more unique and stylish. You might feel you're limited to open chords or you might just not know enough about chords to make something that you feel is a bit more interesting and less generic sounding. So for me, this journey really started when I learned about scale degrees and um, how chords are built. Now, I think particularly with guitar, the how we learn guitar is uh, really a little bit problematic, I think. And I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Thomas, you're curious about my approach. Well, yeah, was, there's a few different approaches. Um, and we'll cover, well, I don't know, two or three. I don't wanna like go into a deep dive into stuff because that can be pretty heavy. Um, but yeah, well, let's, let's go through a couple of things. So the first thing I learned was the scale degrees, which is related to the major scale, and, and then how chords will build. So let's let's talk about that because the problem I think with when way we learn guitar is when we learn guitar. First of all, we, we pick up the guitar and we play a few open chords, right? We'll learn, we'll learn like a G, a D, maybe an A, a C. And what happens in the early days of learning is you associate um, the name of a chord, like a G, with a certain position in, on the neck and a certain configuration of your fingers. I think the problem comes when it's time to move away from that and realize that we call this a G, okay, but it's not the only G. There are plenty of other places to play a G chord, and this is a G note, and there are plenty of other places that you can play a G note. And it's that, I think, that causes people a few problems because for them, this was a finite thing. If you said play a G, this was a G. And now they're told, actually, there's five or six other options. And they're like, uh, do they all look like that one, just in different places? Well, no, they don't. <laughs> they're all different shapes and stuff. And then people go, oh, man, it's all different shapes? I thought I just learned like D, G, C, and A. I think that can cause some problems when people want to expand their chords. So chords, I think learning how, how they're built is important because then it helps you understand your options. You don't know what you don't know. So a little bit of theory we're gonna cover, hopefully not in a particularly challenging way, but the rules for building chords are as follows okay there are number one you need three notes 
to officially call it a chord. Now, remember, this is kind of, you know, centuries ago when the fathers of modern music decided to create some rules around harmony and, and chords and stuff like that. So I know two note chords are kind of valid and and but back back centuries ago we didn't have rock music to give us two note power chords so it's still three notes to officially call it a chord number two is these three note basic building blocks that's kind of what i call them are the basis of all the other more complex chords and number three is that more complex chords are created by adding either one two three or four extra notes to these existing basic building block chords. So if we take a G, G there, right there, okay, it's a three note chord. In that it's got three different pitches in it. I know you're playing all six strings, but if you look at what those notes are, you'll find that actually there are only three different pitches within those six notes. The other three pitches are just duplicates of the existing three. Okay, so for a basic major chord, we've got three pitches out of the major scale, and they are the, the first note in the scale, the third note in the scale, and the fifth note in the scale. One, three, and five. And uh, I always try to emphasize the importance of the major scale as, as a tool because it unlocks so much other stuff. And you can, you, if you know your major scale shape, hey, Vapo, how you going? If you know your major scale shape, good to see you again. You're not out in the woods today. If you know your major scale shape, then that's gonna help with everything we do for the rest, I don't know, for the next 20 minutes or so. So you've got one, three, and five for a basic major chord. Basic minor chords uh, differ in one respect, okay? And that is the one and the five stay the same, but the middle note, the three turns to a flat three. It's flattened. So instead of one, three, five, you get one flat three, because that was a three, that was a flat three. Uh, no today, just at home, <laughs> boring, glad to see you street. Thanks, you. yeah, we missed you last week. Okay, so I was saying, okay, basic chord is one, three, five. Now, what happens when you go beyond those three notes is you just add another note on top of this basic, let's let's call them basic building blocks. You've got basic major building block, one, three, and five, basic minor building block, one, flat three and five. And then anything else, let's, let's say a major seven chord is basically that major building block with a seven on the top, okay? And this is how we go into extended chords because if you take a uh, a major 11 chord, you've got, it starts with that same thing. It starts with the major building block of the one, the three and the five. And then on top of that is the seven. Then on top of that is the nine. And then on top of that is the 11. And that's how we get a major 11 chord. So if you want to understand how chords are built, understand they start with, these three note basic building blocks. And then basically you add each time on top of that one extra note and that extra note is basically the odd numbers. So you get one, three, five, and then you get one, three, five, seven, one, three, five, seven, nine, one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, and one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13. So both in major and minor and augmented and diminished to a degree, you have those options available to you. Whether you know what those fingerings are is a different thing. But this is how we can make, you know, a, a kind of quite normal sounding chord progression, something sound a bit more interesting. So let me do an example. Let's take, all right, let's take an E minor, A, D, and B. E minor, A, D and B. That's pretty generic sound. It's not bad sounding progression, but um, let's start with E minor. Okay, so remember I said we basically get like odd numbers. 
one, three, five, and then one, three, five, seven, nine, one, three, you know, all of those things that I just said. For the minor, obviously it's one flat three, five for the minor chord. So we can change it a little bit by making it a minor seven chord, which is one flat three, five flat seven. So instead of like that, it sounds like, it sounds like that. So that sounds a little more interesting. Now we're going to go. Now, what else can we do? What's our options? First, let's just look at the options for our minor chord. The minor chords options are the same as the major chords, apart from you know using the minor building block. So you've got minor, straight minor. You've got minor seven. You've got minor nine. You've got minor eleven. You've got minor thirteen, and you've got any kind of things in between. You've got minor six. And the only way to to know if it works in your progression is Put it in there and see what your ears tell you because there's lots of things that are kind of musically technically correct but don't sound so hot and that's why it's important to to make your own judgment with your own ears right so back to our e minor we change it to an e minor seven yeah that was all right let's do some things with the other chords as well so here's um we had e minor seven to A, to D, to B. We made that E minor seven. Let's change the A to an A seven. Leave the D where it is. And turn the B to a B seven. So you've got a bit more color there. nice okay and what we're not changing the chord we're just adding one more note to the chord so taking it from an a which is a one three and five to uh, an a dominant seven which is a one three five and a flat seven it gives it a certain certain extra color all right let's go a step further let's go to instead of e minor seven let's go to e minor nine now, E minor nine is one of my favorite chords. It sounds awesome. Uh, I first came across it. It sounds ridiculous, but I was asked to play in a, in a show in a pit orchestra. And I didn't read music. And I got this big, big book for the show. It was called, it was a, it's a musical called A Chorus Line. And I got this big big book of um, traditional music. And it did have some chords written over the top, but it was just music. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is gonna be tricky. But it had the chords written. And it was the first time I'd seen a G minor nine. And I can't remember how I worked it out. I think how I worked it out was just using the major scale and going, okay, here's, a, here's an E minor. And then I'm trying to figure out what the nine is i need to put in there so i just counted up one two three four five six seven eight nine and thought okay that's there and here's a bit of an e minor so maybe i'll play that now. e minor nine is a great chord to swap out swap into a progression with just a regular minor chord or a make regular minor seven chord so then we've got a e minor nine Remember we were going to A7. Let's add, um, let's make it an A13. And then let's go to D9. Should we do D9? Yeah, maybe just D9. Oh, D, so that's, um, sorry. Actually D, D9, not D minor 9. So E minor 9, A13. D9. Yeah, it's starting to not sound so great in places there. But to know your options, just know that we've got 135, 1357, 1357, 9, 1357, 9, 11, and 1357, 9, 11, 13. Now, 
that's for basic major, basic minor, minor chords are minor, minor seven, minor nine, minor 11, minor 13, and they will comprise of all those things, but just with a flat three. So that's a lot of talking, but you can see how you can... make uh, a chord progression sound a little more colorful it, it might be what you want you might want to go quite jazzy because that's kind of quite jazzy that one but it does give you a little more color than than what you normally hear and especially kind of in rock and pop stuff these chords don't tend to feature that often um, and they're they're harmonically rich and provide that a little bit more interest and so it's important that you understand how chords are built and then more importantly for you how chords are fingered max sundance hey man how's it going thank you for tuning in again it's good to see you you being the savior of my live streams i appreciate you're back yes you are back i appreciate you coming in obviously i guess you can you can hear this time which is always good Oh, what time is it by you, Max? De, 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 the sound man. Yes, you are. You are both the sound man and the man for saving my bacon that time, right? <laughs> 5 p.m. Okay, 5 p.m. on a Saturday. It's not a bad time to hang out a little bit. Okay, so let's do another example. We we are approaching midnight here in Europe. Ah, oh, dude. Okay, but it's midnight Saturday, right? So you probably been out clubbing, maybe doing some other stuff. You know, maybe if you're in Italy or Spain, you probably don't even you know think about going out till after midnight anyway. So, oh yeah, Max is in Quebec. That's a chance to not use my french <laughs> vapo no you haven't been out today you're in germany okay what's happening in germany at the moment what, what happens on a saturday night in germany what, what's a typical thing hey trinan you're from norway man that must be late by you as well must be very late vapo we drink beer <laughs> of course of course, you drink beer in Germany on a Saturday night, probably on a Friday night, probably, I don't know, a few other times also. <clears throat> we go somewhere and drink and try to get laid. <laughs> the usual stuff. <laughs> what was it that, oh, was it Finland? Uh, oh, pot's legal now, Max. Oh yeah, in Quebec, of course. So you don't really need to go out to Go on a journey. <laughs> Jealous of the pot. Yeah, well, you know, maybe it'll become a worldwide thing. It's certainly popping up in in other places at other times. <clears throat> so I was talking about this, was it Finnish or Icelandic? Maybe it's Icelandic. And this Icelandic guy was saying, oh, in Iceland, in the summer, we do fishing and fucking and the guy says oh what about in the winter he says oh in the winter the fishing's not so good <laughs> i thought that was very cool vapo but i can buy half a liter of quality beer in the supermarket for 50 cents oh okay well i reciprocate the jealousy there 50 cents for beer man yeah, I hadn't spent a lot of time in Germany. I think the time I did go to Germany was when I was at school. We went to we went on a German exchange to Cologne, which was really cool. And we went to um, Cologne Cathedral and uh, another kind of communication tower thing, like a really tall thing with a with a viewing tower on the top. That was cool. I don't really remember much about it, I've got to say. 
apart from yeah being 14 or 15 and I must be 15 being in Cologne it was quite a culture shock because Cologne's quite in it seemed to me quite industrial no well it's just a city I didn't grow up in a city I grew up in the country I grew up next to a farm in a small village and although there was a, a town about six or seven miles away it was still kind of pretty spread out cologne cologne is ugly well apart from the cathedral right i think that's quite a, an interesting and unique landmark for you guys but one of the things um we got taken to was um our exchange students they they took us to their saturday morning activity and we were thinking cool because they went to this big kind of youth center um, we, and they said they were going to be dancing and i was like oh cool it's like a disco but no these guys they were 15 16 year old german young people as i was like 15 or 16 year old english person they were learning ballroom dancing and all the english people were like what the fuck? what's going why would they be learning ballroom dancing there is that what they do they go to clubs and that's what they do it was of course it wasn't uh, but for us it was the first time we saw young people doing something that we felt was an activity that old people did so it kind of blew our minds uh and we didn't really know what to say and they wanted us to join in and of course we were too cool to join in ballroom dancing come on <clears throat> I learned rock and roll dancing and throwing the girls around. Now, if it was rock and roll dancing, Bapo, I actually think I would have said yes, because that's pretty cool. And it's not doing the foxtrot or, you know, the well, I can't remember what else they were doing, but it was very much that kind of stuff. Rock and roll dancing, I think it's cool. I would have said yes to that because I guess that meant you they would play some rock and roll for you to dance to, but they were not playing that. They were playing you know, whatever. I'm trying to think of some ballroom type dancing. I guess you've got the cha-cha-cha, you've got the foxtrot, you've got the tango. Chime in with any others if you're familiar with it. Uh, Germans cannot dance anyway. Well, I don't know. They were doing a pretty good job, I thought. I didn't think they were bad at it. It just, to me, didn't sound, didn't, didn't, if you would have asked me, hey, we're in Cologne Saturday morning, what do you want to do? I wouldn't have gone, oh, can we go ballroom dancing? Can you teach me how to do that? So that was culturally um, eye-opening, as it's supposed to be when you go on a, an exchange to another country, right? Because you're supposed to learn stuff uh, that's, that's different to your culture, and we certainly did. Um, and then they came to us, and we took them to a nightclub, and, and they looked kind of just as bewildered because they maybe couldn't do their ballroom dancing i don't know what kind of dancing we were doing anyway should we get, should we get back to this um so once you've learned about how chords are built then you need to learn the fingerings for them and that sounds problematic and it also sounds like a lot of work to begin with until you understand then actually although we've got in the case of a major chord we've got a major chord we've got a major seven chord we've got a major nine chord we've got a major 11 chord um, remember they're all built from this one building block of this three ingredients of one three and five but you also have to stand understand that because we're guitar players we only have really four fingers maybe a thumb sometimes, but four fingers to play these chords. So you can see that there's an issue there immediately because we've got four note chords, which are seventh chords. You've got major seven, minor seven, dominant seven, and um, minor seven flat fives. Um, for five note chords, you've got ninth chords. And then, well, we've got four fingers. So how do you play a five note chord? Then we've got six note chords, which are 11th chords and seven note chords so how do we do this stuff with only four fingers any ideas do we do we do we go stanley stanley jordan 
Well, the thing is, it's kind of it's kind of counterintuitive because when you're building <laughs> cut a finger, or you could you could ask for somebody else's finger. You, yes, Lewis, you cannot play the fifth. Yes, what we do is kind of interesting and counterintuitive because what we do is the opposite of what we're doing in the theory part of it. In the theory part of it, we are adding notes on basically on top until we're building this stack of notes, okay? But you start actually leaving out some of those notes, which sounds like heresy like we just put them all in and now we're taking them out this doesn't make sense well yeah that's true we've only got four fingers so usually the first to go when you're running out of fingers um is the fifth because the fifth doesn't really add any color to the chord it thickens up the sounds but it doesn't add any color so you can do without that Yes, Lewis, you're ahead of the game. I'm coming to that also. So you can leave out the fifth, which gives you a little bit of freedom. And then the next to go is the root, which kind of sounds like heresy, right? People are like, well, the root is kind of, you know, it gives the chord its name and everything we're doing is in relation to the root and all that. But you don't need to play the root either because uh, if you're playing with other people, which that is an assumption the bass player will play the root note that because that's pretty much a large part of, of what they do so you can also omit the root and that means you've got the option to play these colorful extended um notes in the chord like the 11th and 13th so let's take i mean even if you take if you take a seventh shape like this you might play a seventh you might play seventh like this, and this seventh has got a root, a fifth, a flat seven, a far, um, uh, what's that? That's the major third, and the fifth on the top. But if you play it like that, you've just got the root, the third, and the flat seven. So already, just by using this fingering, which is quite common, I don't think this is a, an unusual fingering, you've already omitted the fifth and it's not like you're playing a six note chord, right? You just, you're actually playing a four note chord using three fingers. If you want to play a nine, which is really common in blues, this is the nine and it's underneath all the others. You've got now, that chord is one, three. It should have a five in it, but we've left it out. We've got a flat seven and we've also got the nine. Now, if we wanted to do uh, a dominant 11 chord, we would have to play it like this. I like dominant 11 because they're so dissonant. So here, this is spelled, we've got the root, which we've said we, we could get rid of, but we're not. We've got the flat seven, we've got the major third, and we've got the 11th. A dominant 11th just before a four chord is a nice move. What else can we do? Like a 13th chord, like a dominant 13th, right? That's a lovely sound. Definitely swap out some seventh chords in your blues for 13th chords, okay? So the 13th is, um, you've still got your root at this time. You've got your flat seven major third and you've got your 13. You know, some people are like, well, why don't I get what's 13? Let's just count up our major scale. We're playing a D dominant 13 or D 13. So place your second finger on the D note and count up your major scale. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And there's our 13th note. Put on the rest of the chord like a cherry on the cake. Another thing that is really nice to do is to use some open strings um, to give a bit more color. And only certain keys 
uh, really work with using open strings, but it's still uh, it's still a nice thing to do. Let's take let's take C minor, no, C sharp minor, A. Lewis, how to make my own chord voicings? Oh, but that's a good question, and a lot of people a lot of people do ask that. Okay, first step to making your own chord voices is understand what we just talked about, which is the ingredients to make a particular chord. And then it's just a question of finding those ingredients on the fretboard. I always do it by intervals, okay? So everything in relation to the root and the major scale. If we wanted to build, we wanted to build, uh, let's say we wanted to build a, an A9. Okay, we're, we're familiar with this kind of ninth shape. Okay. but we wanted to build uh, another voicing of it you know that your ingredients are a one a three a five a flat seven and a nine for an a9 chord so you can just find those obviously starting find the root because that helps you kind of coordinate and relate to everything else but then you can kind of put those in any order. So let's let's take um, let's try and mix this up a bit. It's just a question of well, let's keep that one. Okay, let's start with that one. Maybe put that here instead. The top of this chord is like that, right? Hey, Joe, how's it going? Hello, learned a few SRV songs based on the fingerings on what I heard. I'm just learning enough theory to determine what notes are in the chords and what the names of the chords are. Well, good. I'm glad you're here because this is definitely for you because that's how that's how I learned. Listening to Stevie Ray, actually, and a few other people and um, just playing what I heard but not really knowing why that was called what it was called. <clears throat> But then just, you know, for a few years, just budging it, going, oh, yeah. So that was, an, you know, if you learnt um, Lenny, for example, you'd know some major six chords. I didn't know why they're called major six or major nine. I just knew that that shape was called what it was, right? Let's see if I can remember that. What's the next one? <laughs> I <don't> <laughs> got the great first chord. is this is a major six chord now why why is it called a major six chord joe um well let's examine the tones in it because you kind of need to know i was explaining earlier before you came in don't know if you were about how we build chords and how a basic chord like a basic major chord starts with the, the one the three and the five and that's the third, the first, the third, and the fifth notes in the major scale as it relates to the chord. So if you're in this B, you would walk up the B major scale and find what number notes they are. Okay, so this is the root, obviously. So that's the one. This next note here, well, we need to count up the major scale and find out what that note is. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we've got a one and a six. Sometimes they don't come in numerical order because of the way you play them. Okay, what else we got? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now ten is the third because the third plus seven notes, three plus seven is ten, right? It would normally be here, or if you were playing a lower version of that third. So we've got one. Now we've got a three and a six. Okay, and then this one up the top, 
need to count that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, the 12 an octave lower. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is the 5. Okay, so we've got now a chord which is 1, 3, 5, and 6. And that is the formula for a major 6 chord. <clears throat> Now, I didn't learn these overnight. Joe, I was where you are not, not so long ago. And I really remember the freedom that, that learning the, the scale degrees, basically giving each note in the scale a number and then enabling me just to use the major scale to decode a chord that I came across and go, well, I don't know that chord shape. So why don't I figure out what's in it? And then I can probably figure out or Google what to call it. So yeah, Lenny helped me a lot. And, and thanks Lewis for, for the tone. This is, um, I don't know, it is a tube amp. It's not on very loud, but it works for me. I don't think it's particularly amazing. I certainly listen to other people going, damn, that tone is mean ass. Um, you have the seven S. Oh, do you have a Bogner also? Isn't that an add six chord? Because it doesn't, because it doesn't have what? Well, I think a major six is a major triad. So one, three, five plus a six. Now I've also read other places. Maybe that is one, three, it's one and three, but the five is replaced by the six, I think. I can't quite remember, but in my money, if it's one, three, five, six, I'm pretty sure back in the time that I read and learned about this stuff, it said sixth chord to basically a major triad, one, three, five, plus the six on top, or a minor triad with the six on top. So <clears throat> I don't think it's an add six chord, Lewis. <clears throat> Should I say Lewis, Lewis, Louis? I don't know. Um, so forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, so skipping string. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I was talking about creating your own voicings. And so step one is to know what ingredients you're playing with. And step two is mix them up. You know, do I did this a video the other day about un weird blues chords. Let's let's use that as an example because all I did was take a, a regular chord and I moved a few things around and it started to sound really weird. So, <clears throat> oh, you're mistaking for a nine. Okay, so I was talking about. I think I was going. Was it? I was doing like a B. Yeah, so I was doing a blues in B, and I was going from B to, I was using an E7 or an E9. And it was kind of like a, whoops. It was kind of like a, <clears throat> not a shuffle, but it was like a. That kind of feel. <clears throat> and here's what I did. I, I kept the B. What I did with the E9, well, I started with the E7, right? And I just used the same notes, but I refingered it. And then I played this note on the fourth fret. Okay, and that sounds kind of, no, you don't hear that one a lot of the time. And all I did there was um, double up the, the third of that chord, but an octave lower. So I put the third in the bass, as it were. So then it's going from. Which gives you, it's kind of darker, but it's interesting, right? And it's certainly different. And then I took that one step further and what I did, I took the root away. Okay, so instead of this note, what I did with this note, which is the root of the chord, because we've got the root, the third, and the flat seven. Previously, we've got the third on the bottom, and then it was the root, and then it was the third again, and then it was the flat seven. 
I took the root and I moved the root down two frets. Now, keep in mind that the root or the one is also the eight. Okay, so when you move it down one fret, it becomes the seven. And when you move it down two frets from the one is the flat seven. So what I did there, I went from that chord to this chord. Now, usually you see that kind of chord never as a chord, but usually in a finger exercise it goes. You know, one of those horribly atonal um, spider exercises. But this is a... This is, this is valid. It sounds weird on its own, but listen. So that sounds pretty cool. And you can kind of, kind of do this. Go to the five chord using that same with the uh, the third on the bottom. And you can go. You can walk it up. So when you voice your own chords, you've got um, you've got your own creativity. As long as you understand what ingredients are in there, what ingredients you can leave out, like your fifth or your root, <clears throat> and put things in any order you want that gets gets the uh, uh, sound you're after. Sometimes you get some like that is one of my favourite chords in a in a blues. If we're in the same key, so we're going from that F <coughs> sorry F sharp nine to our e9 instead of doing that move i like this to go from here to here and that's for this one if it was like that now i'm not sure what that is so let's try and work that out <clears throat> So the root should be our E, <coughs> excuse me. We've got this note here, which is our flat seven. And we've got this note right next to it, which causes that interesting dissonance. And that's the root, so that's the root. So you've got basically the dissonance there is between the root, which is here, and the flat seven but they're played on different strings. And then you've got, that's the fifth, I think. Um, no. So that's the third. And that is the... That's the nine, no, that's the six. So we've got what, a root, we've got third, we've got six, and we've got a nine. Can you explain, Lewis says, can you please explain what is a chord notated with the root and a four after, like C4? Okay. My interpretation of that would be that chord contains only two pitches. It contains the root note C, and the fourth of C. <clears throat> I see that, um, I think, in a similar fashion in songbooks where they say C5, okay? My guitar is so loud. Your neighbors come No, they didn't, Vapo. That's nothing to do with me, bro. So C4, I would say, Lewis is like this. This note, the C note, and then the note directly underneath it. So that's the F note. So you've got that two note dyad or power chord. You know, in a kind of. I 
okay those could be termed fourth chords if you wanted or you know but they um other people refer to them as inverted power chords yes so you could see it like that so yeah you could see it as an f power chord but just inverted with the notes in the um reverse order so you've got the c first then the f instead of the f first then the c but um it's to do with consonants and dissonance you can hear that that f power chord if you play it normally with the root in the fifth that sounds a particular way and that sounds kind of quite solid and like that whereas if you're going if you invert it it's got a slightly darker edge because things in fourth are always a little bit more <clears throat> sinister foreboding there's, there's a certain quality when you invert it okay um you get it a lot in rock you get it, i remember i think it has a white snake song do, 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 do. can you turn down your amp your guitar is way louder than you're speaking oh man i'm sorry the microphone's here i will do that <clears throat> I, I don't know if that's better maybe i should just move a bit closer to the mic and maybe the balance will be better is that any better guys you, you could have told me like an hour ago i'm sorry oh good all right well i'm gonna leave it there um for the next time because obviously that's been a bit off-putting thanks from the girl living above me <laughs> dude you cannot pin that on me right there's no way she can hear it from here in new zealand it, that's you're doing i don't know what you've got this live stream running through but it's obviously a big rig but maybe that gives uh gives you a chance to go and speak to her hey and say hey baby sorry about the noise Anything I can do to make it up to you? Huh? Want to go for a coffee? Want to come ballroom dancing with me? I know the fox truck. Yeah. How can we learn chords by ear? Great question. Great question. Love ear training questions. Okay. The secret to ear training is to hum or sing what you hear and what you play. That's it. If you are not on board with the singing or the humming, you can't do it and you're never going to do it. Okay. And by singing, I don't mean to an audience. I don't mean in front of people. I mean, when you're alone with your guitar and you're playing this note, you need to be able to go do, do, do. And then you kind of need to sing what you play. If you make up a melody, like you need to be able to go do, do, do. <clears throat> could have picked something lower maybe if you are learning chord by ear my best advice would be listen to the chord and then first try to pick out the lowest note you can hear and the highest note you can hear because that gives you kind of like the the, the markers the goal posts okay you got the lowest note <clears throat> you got the highest note um, then it's easy to work out what's in between. So that one, you like, do, do, do. All right. So it just needs repeated listening. If you're trying to work out a chord, you've got it on Spotify or something, you need to listen to that one chord, press pause, sing the lowest tone you can hear, and then find that on your fretboard. Maybe write it down to help you remember because sometimes you can forget you lose your place quite easily when you're doing stuff by ear in the early days okay then you try and get the top one okay and then you've got your two marker points and then you just try and sing the others and then write them down and try and build the chord and then once you add your pieces to your chord so you get like three of those so you've got that one that one and that one so play that gently when you 
press play, play what you're doing against what you're trying to hear to confirm that those are definitely the notes in the chord and then try and find out the other ones. <clears throat> Joe says you can't do that. Vocal cord issues, voice keeps changing. Um, but can you hum or even whistle? Those are also options. It might not be, you know, your the next Bruno Mars or Celine Dion or pick whichever great singer that you want insert to that sentence. But humming, can you do humming, Joe, or whistling? If you, I, I'm, I hope that you can do one of those because <clears throat> it's 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 to do with this internal and external externalization of you can whistle okay great whistling is fine i even saw a video by barney kessel talking about exactly this training your ear by humming something or whistling and he talked about whistling quite a lot actually so if you can whistle you're good but there's this thing we need to do we need to connect this notion of what we think a note sounds like with the vibration the physical manifestation of that particular pitch in terms of vibration of the throat or, you know, passing air through your vocal cords or mouth somehow for the body to have a muscle memory of that pitch in the same way your body has a muscle memory of which fingers are doing which scale shapes, right? This is muscle memory. This is also muscle memory. So that's why we need to think of the note if we're, and then externalize that by creating a vibration and then match that with a place on the fretboard with this synthetic vibration that we create um, with magnetism, electricity, steel and wood. And I've also heard Joe Satriani talk about that and his training with um, Lenny Tristano who got him to do exactly that. He was insistent that he had to externalize that note by creating a vibration in his own body first before moving to this. So Louis, that will help you get chords by ear. And um, also, you know, there are other things you can do to get chords by ear. One of the things um, that I talk about in my ear training course is assigning an adjective to the sound of a chord, okay? I know we always talk about major chords and minor chords being happy and sad. <laughs> But what about the others? Uh, and for me, I assign, <clears throat> okay, they work on my vocal cords about once a year, lose my voice for about a month afterwards and have to go to speech therapy to relearn speaking. Man, that's tough. I'm sorry to hear that, Joe, but I guess once a year is better than once a month. I don't know what to say, but that sounds like a pretty tough situation. Um. Adjectives with chords, like I've got, here's my major chord, happy, all right? Now, major seven chord for me. For me, the adjective I use for a major seven chord is summer. It sounds summery to me. It just gives me that feeling. Now, it might not give you that feeling, but what you need to do is find an adjective that that chord, the major seven chord, means to you, okay? And if you can associate an adjective with a chord, then you f you get better at recognizing those chords by ear because it gives you a feeling. Oh yeah, that gives me the feeling of summer. So, ah, oh, it's a major seven chord, right? Major seven, summer for me. Dominant seven. Yeah, Lewis, major seven is kind of sleepy. Yeah, a lot of people could kind of talk about it being dreamlike dreamy um so yeah whichever adjective works for you so for me dominant seven that's kind of sassy for me or gospely i kind of you know either of those work for me so when when i kind of feeling i hear something and it makes it connects with me in a kind of sassy way for a moment. I'm like, oh, that must be one of those dudes. <clears throat> Minus seven. Minus 
minor seven for me has always been soulful, right? <laughs> Obviously, it's using soul tracks and funk and lots of lots of others, you know, lots of other genres. But for me, that's always been soulful. So um, the ear training course takes you through learning about intervals. And uh, then we talk about how to hear major and minor and certain exercises. And then we talk about how to go beyond major and minor into these dominant seven, major seven, minor seven, those kind of things. And then we talk about some 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 weird chords and then well there's there's a bunch of stuff in there you can go check it out i'll drop the link um in the chat box see if i can find you a discount code since you're loyal <laughs> loyal dudes, since you're here today um let's have a look hopefully i can do this on the fly and you won't even notice because it's so seamless not um, <laughs> um ear training ear training for guitarists um ba -ba -ba -ba. um thanks i didn't know you had a website yeah um well 15 minute guitar practice dot com is the website i tend to post a lot of stuff there but i do have some courses on teachable which you can here's the, the link to all the courses that though if you wanted to check out some some things there's musical finger exercises there's an ear training course there's a, a flagship course called brave your first blues jam which is like a 90-day program to help people go from playing in their bedroom to actually going and playing live for the first time and all the things you need to understand about live playing plus some you know some tips about other stuff too but um back to this ear training boot camp yeah. oh, okay look i will just I'll grab it from here oh man i gotta log in and all that stuff um <laughs> you got it all right thank you i'm trying to find the uh, the discount code because you know because you're here so why don't i kind of thank you for for being here let me um all right well i might post it at the end dude um i don't want to waste your time because it's coming up to the time I need to go, but there are some things on offer there. If you've got any questions, massive discount appreciated. Um, <laughs> um, all right, well, let me see what I can do while you're here. Let me let me go the extra extra yard and waste your time a bit on the live stream in an attempt to um, get you that. Oh, hang on. What's that? All right, let me see. This might be it, guys. <laughs> Don't want to build it up too much. Because, you know, you know what happens when I do that? Um, I usually fail and it's wrong. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'll post it anyway. And then if it works it works i'm pretty sure it works i just don't know how how much off it gets you because i'm logged in at this stage anyway i hope you guys have um <laughs> enjoyed being here today we've covered a few things i didn't cover probably all that i that i wanted to but I, I kind of appreciate you guys turning up and us having a bit of a chat it's it's kind of takes the pressure off just trying to talk at you um so Lewis, Vapo, Joe, um, and there was another few dudes. Somebody was, oh, Max, Max Sundance, Crinan, all you guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to hop off now. But um, please, if you want um, other subjects talked about, you can put 
uh, a comment now in the live chat if you've got any suggestions about stuff you'd like me to talk about. Or if you are watching the replay of this, then, then jump in and drop a comment below this video. And Thomas, I forgot to mention you because you were first in. Sorry about that, dude. But thank you all for joining me. Have a great rest of your day, evening or morning. Um, no live stream next Sunday because it's Father's Day here in New Zealand. And last year I scheduled some things that were clashing with that and I I got a little bit into trouble by certain people that had, I go, I've got the silent treatment and a few sighs and tuts for a few days after. So I won't be <laughs> making that same mistake again. So I will see you maybe um, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. Uh, if you subscribe to the channel, then I think you get a notification. Okay, Joe would like soloing over chords. Uh, yeah, I, that comes up a lot. I'd love to talk about that. I did do a live stream, <clears throat> I think three weeks ago, which, or maybe five weeks ago, talking about that, Joe. Maybe I can grab that um, before I go. Um, come on, dude, get it together. Yeah, I think it was the first, first live stream. Okay. Let me just grab that while I'm here, while you're here. And then I'll say goodbye. Okay, so it was. What do we do? Blues solo, blues chord extensions. How to learn songs fast, effective practice. Um, it's here somewhere. Why isn't it at my fingertips? Come on. Louis, another live with chords would be neat. All right, dude. Well, maybe we can kind of, um, you know, soloing over chords is a lot to do with the chords. So maybe we can combine both of those. Okay, I th I'm thinking it's this one. Um, Joe, I'm thinking it's this one. This is more about um, blues phrasing, but um, it might give you a couple of things to get working with. Okay, yeah, chords is where it's at. It totally is. Play too many power chords in my life. Yeah, dude, I hear you. I was once I once I learned the power chords were neither major or minor and they could go over anything. I played those for about a year and a half, two years, going, well, I don't need to worry about anything else. These work over everything. Like arrogant little kid with a guitar making an angry noise. Uh, it just validates my opinion that I didn't have to learn everything to rock. Um, which of course you don't, but it kind of helps if you do. Don't don't go. I'm okay with this. I only need to know one scale shape. That that's not a productive way of growing as a musician. Just closing the door on stuff because uh, ultimately I was too lazy to buy. Ah, yeah, that's why I don't need all of that. This already works. That's a very self-limiting belief. Anyway, guys, in the beginning I received a warning about power chords. Ten years later, I know why. Yeah. It seems to come with age and a little bit of wisdom, doesn't it? I'd still be playing Gloria if that were the case. <laughs> yeah, I played that at Jam uh, a few weeks ago, Joe, and it's still a great, um, it's a great song to play. Everybody really gets into the, you know, the big Glorias at the end. Um, okay. Anyway, look, it's it's ten past ten on Sunday morning here. I'm speaking to you from the future. Just to let you know that Sunday is looking good and you will have a great one. So enjoy that. And I will see you not next week, but the weekend after. Um, if I can squeeze something else in maybe on a different day, I will try and I'll take your comments on board. Joe and Vapo and Louis about chords. I'll look into it. I'll come up and give you what, I, what I've got about that, all right? So thanks again, everybody. I will see you next time. Bye for now. Cheers, guys.